Hello, my name is Rainer Schmidt, and today we will talk about artificial intelligence. So uh, here, a short overview of my talk. So first, we will have a look on what is artificial intelligence. And because there has been so many uh, interest into machine learning, we will clarify the relationship to machine learning. Then we will have a deeper look on to neural networks and deep learning. And uh, finally, uh, we will also look at how we can implement our AI initiatives uh, using open source software. And uh, uh, finally, there is a conclusion uh, talking about what happens next uh, in the area of artificial intelligence. Okay, so of course the question now, what is artificial intelligence? There are definitions. Uh, this one I like uh, most uh, from François Cholet, who writes a very important book uh, on deep learning uh, with uh, Python. And uh, he says uh, it's an effort to automate intellectual tasks normally performed by humans. So we try to automate things, decisions, um, procedures that normally um, are accomplished by human beings and uh, that are then transferred uh, to computers. So the area of artificial intelligence uh, is very wide. So there is artificial intelligence in a very broad sense. There we find also subjects such as uh, robotics, symbolic AI, and so on. And then if we focus our interest, we see that there is machine learning uh, with mechanisms like regression, recommender systems, and so on. And uh, then there are neural networks. Uh, that is the area that uh, got uh, most attention in the last years uh, because there were huge advances. Uh, for example, we now have um, machine translation that fits uh, in many situations and uh, achieves uh, human performance. So let's first have a look on artificial intelligence. And uh, here you can see there are many ups and downs. So the first ideas about something such as artificial intelligence started in the 1950s. There was a letter of Alan Turing uh, where he envisioned something um, that would be called artificial intelligence uh, today. And um, then the interest increased because in these years, the 1950s, 1960s, all the uh, uh, computers more and more get, uh, got into traction. There was this famous Dartmouth workshop where people started uh, to develop a, a research program for artificial intelligence. Uh, then, of course, there were some disappointments. And uh, that led uh, to a decline in the interest of uh, AI. Again, it uh, climbed in the 1970s. Uh, uh, then there was a, yes, a sharp decline after a Lighthill report that showed that artificial intelligence did not uh, succeed in certain areas that were uh, um, assumed as uh, easy to reach targets, uh, such as uh, machine translation. And uh, we had another climb in the 1980s and 90s. And uh, so you see it's an up and down uh, over the years, but in the last years we have a steep increase in interest uh, to artificial intelligence. We can see that, for example, uh, if we look at the attendance of, uh, at large conferences, and here you can see this ancient peak of interest uh, in the 1980s uh, and early 1990s, 
Then we had, uh, yes, AI winter, so are these phases called when, um, yeah, the interest into artificial intelligence uh, declines. And in the last years, we have a very sharp increase. You can see it uh, on the right side uh, with this huge uh, amount uh, of participants uh, in the large uh, AI conferences. Let's uh, have a look on some flavors of AI first. And for a long time, the most popul uh, popular um, type of AI is symbolic AI. Um, it manifested in expert systems. So the idea was to extract uh, the knowledge from experts in a formalized way. That means formulas or programming like uh, structures. And uh, this was based on classical control uh, systems, uh, but it was uh, connected with a very high effort. So everything has um, had to be created by humans. And uh, so these computers could only do what the humans can do and what they are uh, able to express. And this symbolic AI was a dominant paradigm from the 1950s to the late 1980s. But, uh, there was skepticism about this approach. So there is a philosopher, Pollyani, who wrote it down in this paradox, we know more than we can tell. And uh, that was an experience many researchers in the area of artificial intelligence had. Um, they interviewed experts and they found often they use their rational mechanisms only yeah, to um, explain why they had decided in a certain way, but their decision was made already before. There um, were these critical voices and also um, Moravec's paradox uh, joins uh, Pogliani, so he says, it is comparatively easy to make computers exhibit adult level performance on intelligence tests or playing checkers and difficult or impossible to give them the skill of a one year old when it comes to perception and mobility. So the observation was that these symbolic AI systems um, of the 1960s, 1970s were able to solve mathematical equations, to solve um, quizzes and so on, but it was difficult for them to um, differentiate two uh, different peoples. Let's start now to speak a little bit about machine learning. So machine learning um, was the first approach to break with this classical engineering uh, approach that is embedded into uh, symbolic AI. Because here at the top you can see it, it takes uh, data and the answers connected. So the machine learning learns from true or false examples and it derives the rules automatically. And that's uh, completely different to the classical programming or the symbolic AI that uh, works as described below. So we have rules that are extracted or uh, developed uh, with the uh, experts and then we take the data and we get the answers. So there's a huge difference and uh, that made uh, many people uncomfortable with this machine learning because often it is not really possible to explain why certain rules uh, are applied. Uh, we only can say that it uh, is right from the uh, perspective of data that these rules were found in the data, but 
Uh, there is no explanation why. To explain a little bit uh, the working of machine learning, here's a small example. So um, the interviewer asks, what's your biggest strength? So me, I'm an expert in machine learning. So the interviewer asks you, what's nine plus 10? So I make my first guess, it's three. Interviewer, no, even not even close, it's 19. Me, it's 16. Interviewer, wrong, it's still 19. Me, it's 18. Interviewer, no, it's 19. Me, it's 19. You are hired. Yes, that's the way machine learning is working. So uh, it's a trial and error process and that uh, slowly um, nears to the right solution. So uh, the system does not learn rules uh, from a symbolic representation, but uh, it detects the rules from the data. Okay, so what is embedded in this machine learning? So we have some raw data. You see, it's perhaps difficult to find nice limitation between the two groups. So we can start here uh, by changing the coordinates. And you see, it's a little bit squeezed, but we can slowly see the solution. And finally, if we normalize everything, we can see that we uh, have a clear separation between the red and the blue ones. So, and in this manner work many machine learning approaches, for example, regression, uh, where we estimate or predict uh, the numerical value of some variable. Here, for example, uh, we want to predict how many units of a certain product are sold at a certain temperature. Think, for example, of your, your selling ice cream and you want to predict how many units are sold on a certain day with a certain temperature. So the, another yeah, important uh, type of machine learning approach is clustering. So uh, here we don't know right solutions, but it's about finding associations to finding groups of uh, products or individuals that share certain properties and uh, therefore we create uh, different clusterings. The interesting thing is there often is no right solution because uh, we don't know uh, even uh, if it's delivered to us. Instead, we have to uh, test it in practice, but the clustering helps us to find different uh, associations of individuals, for example, customers that have the same uh, requirements. 